Hello, I'm Dr. Roy Shelburne, and you are watching The Best Practices Show. Hey guys, you're watching The Best Practice Show. We take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over the world. And I have a crazy huge treat for you. One of my great friends that I get to see who's an influencer in dentistry and knows a lot. You're going to love this, Dr. Roy Shelburne. You do not want to miss this. So do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. You're going to love it. Now, before we get started, a couple show notes. We are shooting this show live on Facebook and we're having a ton of fun doing it. Just have We just have all of our friends on here. We are up now over 38,000 followers on Facebook. I don't even know how that's happened. 150,000 of you have visited us on iTunes. Uh, just thank you, thank you, thank you. So I uh, really appreciate all the suggestions, shares, and even yesterday, so much fun. Keep sending us those suggestions. And as you're watching this, if you hear something during the broadcast, you're like, hey, I have a question, add it to the feed, and I'll ask Roy while he's on because we want to get the, the answers from the master himself and we'll, because we want you to get the most out of these. And then a lot of you are watching this later on, you know, in the evenings, continue to add questions to the feed. You're going to see Roy's really good with social media. He'll be able to get back to you and get you great answers. Now, my guest today, I love this guy. I always joke, like I'm, he's the best looking bald guy in all of dentistry. You're by far the best dresser. You know, you got to take me shopping one of these days because every time I see you, man, I'm like, I'm wearing the Garanimals version of like a suit. You, you look like polished and uh, all that stuff. Now, um, I know who you are. Many people in dentistry, if you're going to any type of CE event, you know exactly who Roy is because he is everywhere at all the meetings. But if somebody's watching this because we have dental students that are watching this and they don't know who Dr. Roy Shelburne is, can you tell us who Dr. Roy Shelburne is? I'll do my best. Um, graduated from dental school in 1981, set my practice up in my grandfather's hardware store building and practiced there very happily for 27 years. Had flown from the western part of Virginia to San Francisco, California, the American Dental Association meeting. I was listening to Rudolph Giuliani give the keynote that year and my phone rang. It was my wife. I waited till Giuliani finished. I returned the call to her. It was strange that she would call because she knew I was in this meeting, but did to find out that the FBI had come to my office, had battered down my back door and were taking all my records. Uh, not a bad, not a good day. Talked to her for a while and tried to decide what in the world I was going to do. I ended up calling my office. It was on a Friday. Didn't expect anybody to be there. The phone was answered. The voice on the other end of the phone said, hello. And I said, hello, who is this? And they said, introduce themselves. And they were an FBI agent. And I asked them what they were doing in my office. And they said they had executed a search warrant. I was the target of a healthcare fraud investigation. Long story short, I was investigated for three years, was indicted, um, went to trial and was found guilty of healthcare fraud, racketeering and money laundering. Um, the amount that I got that I wasn't entitled to, well, first, the amount I was paid over the six year period where they did the evaluation was three and a half million dollars. And the amount that I got of the three and a half million dollars I was paid that I wasn't entitled to was $17,899.57, which is 0.05% of the amount that I had submitted for payment. And although we were able to establish there was treatment that I provided and should have been for, paid for and could have been paid for, I didn't submit the claim, should have, in excess of that amount, it didn't make any difference. So the money didn't make any, any difference at all. So learned a lot in the process, have learned since. I've devoted my life to being an expert in the area of billing, coding, and documentation because I want to be the last healthcare professional that goes to prison for what they didn't know. Ignorance is no excuse. You have to be, as the owner of the practice, responsible for everything that is documented, everything that's submitted to the insurance carrier, everything that is posted when paid. Even though we may not be involved in the process, there needs to be systems in place to identify and correct errors. So I've devoted myself to sharing my story in hopes of preventing the same from happening to others. So that's, that's my story in a nutshell. 
Yeah, and if you're in dentistry and you haven't seen this guy speak, you've got to go. Because the first part of your lecture, I'm like, oh, my gosh, no way. <laughs> and you're freaking out, you know. Um, and then what's really cool about you, Roy, is you help people see, hey, look, don't do some of these things. There, sure. There's a path here, and you got to stick to the path. And through your sure. story, Roy, you've helped so many people. Like I've had oh, dentists come to me and go, oh, my gosh. You know, I wasn't doing anything wrong, but I also realized I wasn't doing – a lot of things right. And so sure. they went back to their offices and cleaned things up. And so if you're watching yeah. this today and you, and if you have a study club, Roy's your guy, like have him out. Cause it is awesome to listen to him. So, and Roy, today we're going to be talking about one of the hottest topics. I love this is dental benefits, where they're headed. Right. And you said you can either be proactive or reactive. Now, before we get into the how, let's talk about the why, why is that such a hot topic today? Insurance has changed markedly. When I first opened my practice, conventional insurance, you submitted your claim with the amount on your fee and they would pay the fee. If it was 80%, they'd pay 80% and there wasn't a whole lot of difference between what I submitted. Even if the plan had an annual ma uh, maximum, uh, it was very close to the full amount. In today's world, with the competition as it is, carriers are looking to reduce the amount that the uh, buyers of that plan have to pay and as a result there have been significant restrictions on reimbursement if you're not ahead of it if you don't position yourself intelligently in the system you may end up losing money when you see patients if for example if your overhead is 40 percent and you have or 60 percent and you have to write off 50 percent 10 percent is the shortfall. You actually have given 10% for the pleasure of being able to see that patient. So you actually end up behind. So we need to be aware of how the system is changing, how we maximize our legitimate benefits. Um, there are some tricks. There are a little bit of um, negotiation possible. And we need to understand what, what we can do, what we can't do, and how we maximize our reimbursement positioning ourselves in that insurance world um, if you care to do that. Insurance benefits have have changed. Like I said, in the beginning, there was conventional insurance, but today the big player are PPOs. Mm -hmm. So if you look back at 2004, maybe between 45 and 50% of plans were PPOs. Okay. Today, those figures are more like 90% of all plans sold in the United States are PPO plans. So if the practice is feeling more pressure to join more plans, it's because the majority of the patients who are insured have a PPO type coverage plan. So working within that system, is there a way to maybe join one network that will maximize your benefit from another network? Yes, that is possible. For example, there are many of the providers of plans who now interlink they are kind of like a, a web if you are participating with one then it automatically makes you participate in all the other group that's associated with you can become providers of all the different groups that are interlinked however if you do that you are bound by the lowest fee schedule Mm -hmm. So if you've got five different plans, you're a member of five different plans, they have five different fee schedules, they will all pay based on the lowest fee schedule. There's a way to be able to do some research to find out who has the, the greatest fee schedule, the highest fee schedule, enroll with only that plan, but because they also participate with all the other plans, they pay you at the highest rate because you have signed a contract with that plan that has the highest fee schedule. That's one of the ways that you can be able to understand the system and use it to your benefit if you are diligent in being able to do the research. Yeah. Now this is just, a lot of us are watching this and I, even myself, I'm, you know, overwhelmed with the thought of this, but let's say a couple things before we dive into this, you know, number one, this is not going away. Like we could sit here and say, Oh, it's not going away. You know, the number one reason why patients still go to a dentist in the United States is because they perceive they have benefits of some kind. It's sad. Right. It's the number one reason. Correct. Number, number two is that um, we can't sit here and commiserate because you see this all the time. I get to people. We can sit and just, you know, 
blast the insurance companies, but we're not going to do any, any favors to ourselves by doing it's, that. It's not going away. It's not changing. It is what it is. The thing that we need to do is educate ourselves right. to the limitations and those plans and to position yourself where it is most favorable. And there are ways to do that. You know, the, the huge gorilla is Delta Dental. Um, and Delta has actually reduced benefits in a couple of states that uh, rather than increasing their fee based on the cost of living increase, they've actually decreased their reimbursement uh, 15% in California. Um, they did that full, fully well understanding that there would be a number of dentists who would then drop the plan but they have the ability to do the calculations understood that they have significant number of dentists in that network so that their, their insured would still be able to get care. So they, they reduced the fee knowing full well that there would be a lot of people drop out. And they did that certainly um, to reduce the amount, the cost for Delta uh, in a particular area. So that's, people wonder about keeping up with the cost of living and fee increases. That's not going to happen. Right. It's shocking in today's world, the number of people who are now participating. Insurance companies will reduce fees, understanding that there'll be a number who drop out and they don't care because there'll be enough enough in that network, enough dentists left in the network to be able to provide care for their patients. So really don't care. Right. Now, the other thing, too, um, is that I'm hearing as I'm out on the road, they're just shutting down some of these programs like the premier program is just being mm -hmm. taken away. Eliminated. Yes. And some of these younger dentists that are on PPO go, wait a minute, wait a minute, I bought a premier practice and now I'm on PPO. And then the other thing I see, Roy, can you speak to this? I have yeah. young dentists, if you're watching this, I have young dentists coming and go and they go, well, I bought a Delta premier practice. I'm like, no, you didn't. The dentist that you purchased the practice from was on that. You, my friend, are not. And they go, no, 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 my broker told me. I'm like, your broker has no idea what they're talking about. Can you sure. speak to that? Because this is not my yeah. area of expertise. Yeah, absolutely. Delta is in the process of phasing out their premier product. Um, okay. They understand that it's unaffordable, that they can't continue to be able to support that. So in an effort to um, push everybody into the PPO product, if you are a new dentist enrolling in Delta, or if you're an old dentist who have been a Delta premier provider and changed their location, that will change the participation in that you will only be a PPO provider. Really? You have to be a PPO provider, yeah. So there again, the dentists who have actually been in Delta, if they, in today's world, there are a lot of dentists who are buying up practices or have become uh, pro providers in different areas. Those dentists who move the location and are in a different, um, different office they also will be bumped out of Premier and to the regular uh, PPO provider. So the the world of Premier reimbursement is over. It is over completely. It and is you're over. seeing, is it specific to certain states? I mean, probably not. I mean, what are you seeing? What you know? it's it's all it's all over. Um, like I said, it's kind of a moot point in that Delta doesn't sell Premier products anymore. Right. So it's kind of grandfathered in if you're there, but if you change any uh, the location, if you bring in a new associate, the new associate's going to be PPO as well. And, you know, that that if the owner doctor is actually in premier, that sets up a whole different dynamic in the practice. How do you ethically um, place that patient with the new dentist or the old dentist? The reimbursement would be better with the dentist who's been in network and our premier rather than the PPO. But once the patient figures out there's a difference there, there can be a, an issue there as well with, with yeah. that patient. It's it's a it's a it's a nightmare trying to explain that. Yeah, and people are chiming in already. Our good friend Lori Owen says, "Yes, Delta has done a lot more than even reduce benefits. They are having offices change codes, so there yeah. will be a huge write-off." Can you speak to that? They uh, they don't change codes. They what we call rebath. If a if an insurance company actually changed your code, that's an issue that the American Dental Association they want to know about, and they'll address that. They can't change codes. You use the code that best describes the service you provided. They can't change codes, but they can remap it to a different code. Really? The the technical term for that is the least expensive alternative benefit. That's leaks 
clause, which means they can change, say, um, a bridge to a partial denture because a partial would be the least expensive alternative benefit to replace that too. That changes the whole the whole reimbursement and a method to be able to receive your full fee. And if it's okay to chase this rabbit now, there's most plans have what's called the uh, optional service clause. So it would be an optional service when the insurance company only pays for that partial and the patient wants the bridge or the implant. The difference between the partial that they're going to pay for and the bridge or the implant that you're actually going to be providing is considered an optional service. And there's some hoops that you need to jump through to be able to get that reimbursed. Number one, you have to have the discussion with the patient. They need to understand that the insurance is only going to pay for the least expensive alternative benefit, this partial, but they want to have a bridge, something that's non-removable. So you need to put together a document that discloses to the patient the amount that you expect the insurance to pay from their limitation and the amount that you're going to be charging for the bridge that they've agreed to. Um, have them sign that document, attach that to the claim that you send to the insurance company so they're aware that the patient has accepted the difference between the least expensive alternative benefit and what you're actually providing them and will reimburse what they, uh, they're going to allow with a partial, but it allows you to charge the difference between what they're going to pay and what the patient uh, has instructed you and agreed to have provided for them. That's kind of confusing, but... If you um, if they'll contact me at the website, I'll um, give them a uh, sample agreement. It's in word form. They can put it on their letterhead. They can use that to be able to uh, have that discussion with the patient. Basically, it's an informed consent that the patient wants the bridge. They don't want the partial, and they understand that they're going to pay the difference. And once agreed upon, most plans have do recognize optional services. And if you've done that. Um, you'll be able to charge the difference between, so you're not going to be limited to that least expensive alternative benefit and having to write off the difference. If you don't take that action prior to, there's a good chance that you will be limited to what will be in reimbursed and what the patient will pay. Yeah, and I'm just telling you now, if you're watching this, you've got to reach out to Roy because Roy, this this is obviously overwhelming for most dentists that are watching because there's so sure. many hoops that we have to go to. Yeah. But this guy's a genius. Now, Roy, I want to get back because I have so many questions. Okay, let's go back to where um, dental benefits are headed. What are some other things that we need to know if we're watching this about what the future holds for dental benefits? Ultimately, there'll be no dental benefits available. The industry is moving very rapidly toward submission of medical codes, right. the ICD-10 codes. It's going to be medical coding, medical billing. And the reason for that is insurance companies don't like to maintain two separate tracks for processing claims. In today's world, MetLife has a different area for dental claims and they have a different area for their medical claims. That's twice as expensive as if you only had one. So there are rapidly trying to move people into the medical billing coding field. And to be honest with you, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Generally, if it's covered with medical, the coverage is better than with dental. Um, there, there's some hoops that there, again, you need to be aware of when you're doing that medical coding, but I encourage the practices to become aware of what's reimbursable under medical and to use those benefits to the maximum because they will be reimbursed at a higher rate. Um, the, is it more complicated? It is. Uh, are there tools to be able to help in that process? Yes, they are. It's, it's not a matter of if it's going to transition from dental billing, dental coding to medical. It's, it's when it's going to happen. Um, the sooner you embrace it and become prepared, the better off you're going to be. Uh, and to be honest with you, it's going to be beneficial to the industry, in my opinion, because the reimbursement is is different and it's more consistent. Yeah. So if you haven't started that process, well, to be honest with you, there are a lot of times that dental now won't pay unless the medical claim, claim has been filed prior to. So it's, it's, it's moving in that direction. And what changed in the 2012 ADA claim form? Kirk, do you know? 
Yes, I don't know, but I know about it. So take us through that because you and I have talked about this. Yes. Yeah, there's actually a section on that claim form that was added for diagnosis codes. Why in the world would there have been that box added if there was not an intent to use it? And one state in particular, if a dentist writes a prescription, they, the dentist, have to put a diagnosis code on that prescription before it will be filled. Okay. And that's Indiana, I believe. So um, Indiana is aware of the fact that we have to have a diagnosis code prior to giving that patient a prescription. Otherwise, it will not be filled at the pharmacy. Wow. So, yeah, really changing. Yeah, no, I know. There's so many avenues we can go down. I completely agree with you. And I'm hearing consistently from the practices that we coach that want to do great quality restorative dentistry, that medical coding is an opportunity. Like I keep getting these stories are like, you're not going to believe what this patient got reimbursed for this <laughs> entire case. And, um, the first thing they go is they're like, it just doesn't make sense, but it's working. And then yeah. their second thought is, can I add this? Cause I don't know what sure. to say to this. What is this going to take dentistry towards the medical model? And I'm like, I don't know, but I'll ask you that question. We're already moving in that direction. Right. Um, the medicine, um, 15 years ago, the majority of physicians were independent. Mm -hmm. um, not today. Um, I think this, the statistic is 7% of physicians are now independent. Others are, the rest are in groups, work for hospitals. So there's actually um, a particular area in the practice, either in the hospital or in the large group medical practice that handle all the billing and coding. The same thing's going to happen in dentistry. Um, no longer will we be able to hire that individual, give them two weeks training and have them do dental coding as we are today. If you have to do medical coding, those people are certified. So as far as a career track for those individuals who might be interested in uh, focusing on medical billing and coding, this is a perfect opportunity to be proactive. We're talking about being proactive here yeah. to get that certification in medical billing and coding because that will place you in a very strong position for employment in the future, especially with large group practices. Those people, individuals and groups that do a lot of billing and coding the perfect yeah. opportunity to be able to get that education to qualify to do that. Absolutely. And it's not hard to do. We've actually, somebody just chimed in that's watching. One of our watchers says, Alexandria Shea, I've done medical billing for a dentist. It's not that much more work and super easy to do. Also, the reimbursement is higher. Speak about the yeah, easier complex. Is it easier? Is it more complex? You know, it's, it's more complex in that there are diagnosis codes or probably multiples. And as far as in dentistry now, there are probably 650, 660 codes um, as far as treatment codes. In the ICD-10, there's 19,000. So they're a huge number, but they're, again, not all of them um, are usable in the dental world, but it, that's going to reduce it some. But um, once you understand how and the sequence to be able to document um what you're doing and why you're doing it, it, it becomes simple. You know, it's one of those things is a learning curve, absolutely. But once you get to the point where, okay, I understand the basics, it's just a matter of being able to find that code. There are reference materials that will help you to be able to do that. Yeah, this is awesome, buddy. I've, yeah. we, could, we could easily do a four-hour show on this one. But I yeah. want to get I want to get back to your original topic, which is let's be a little bit more proactive when it comes to where dental benefits are headed because you have a lot of thoughts on this. What else could I do if I'm a dentist watching this to be more proactive about where dental benefits are headed? Yeah, you need to understand that the benefits are never going to get better. The companies are actually going to um, come together. Um, there's going to be uh, more sharing as far as the benefits and more networks to be able to be in. And they're there. Again, you need to position yourself. And you also, when you are trying to identify whether or not you want to be in that plan, you need to be careful. Most people just look at the fee schedule and think, okay, this is, this is going to be a good fee schedule for me. But there can be other stipulations in that contract that make it so that there are limitations where um, you're not going to be reimbursed for things you thought you might be reimbursed for. Um, I would encourage you to use the American Dental Association. They have um, 
a, a section that if you send a contract to them, they'll review it. They won't tell you whether or not you should be in or out, but they will identify areas that could put you at risk or um, make it so that you may not be able to um, be able to provide ideal dentistry if you limit yourself to insurance. And I'm going to chase this rabbit a little bit as well. Never base your diagnosis, never base treatment on what the insurance is going to reimburse. You'll never yeah. meet the standard of care. Now, dig a little deeper on that. Care. I love that. Explain yeah. what that means. Let's go into that. Well, <laughs> we have, a, as an industry have, to some degree, bought into the patient's perception. If the insurance doesn't pay for it, I don't want it. So we tend to look at the treatment plan and to some degree allow the reimbursement to drive that treatment plan. Wrong. That's wrong for the patient. It's wrong for the practice. It's just wrong. And for example, um, sometimes I'll do audits of practices and I'll see a notation in the clinical record that says x-rays are not due. My hope when I ask the individual who made that notation when I ask them, what does this mean? I hope they say, well, the doctor reviewed the patient's health history, some of the risk factors, um, and determined that at this point, the patient does not need to have that radiograph taken. But I never get that answer. When I ask, what does it mean when it says x-rays are not due? The answer is always these, the insurance is not going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. You cannot base the frequency of your x-rays you can't base it on any set time. So a patient who is at high risk has a lot of decay in the past, has um, a dirty mouth when they come in. Should you take x-rays more frequently? Absolutely. To be able to help to diagnose that probable area of decay. Or if you have a patient that's been in your practice for six, seven years, have never had anything necessary, have... Uh, they come in and their mouth is very clean. They need very little scaling. Everything looks great. Should you take a set of bite wings every year on that patient? No, that's overexposing the patient. So always base your treatment decisions on what is in the best interest of the patient. Yeah. Never. Yeah. So just one of those examples, never let the insurance company drive what we provide to our patients. And that discussion should never hinge around what the benefits are. The discussion with the patient should always only consist of what you, as that provider and responsible for their care and treatment, would consider appropriate based on the standard of care, not on the standard of reimbursement. I love that thought so much, Roy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to totally bang that drum uh, based on what you said, because also, too, if you're watching this, you might say, well, that makes sense, Roy. It's on. But it's the tip of the iceberg when you start thinking that way, because what's going to happen is your team starts thinking that way, and yeah. then they start conditioning patients to think that Correct. way. And then you get mad. You're like, this insurance thing runs my whole practice. Well, who created that in the first place, right? Yeah, sometimes we're our own worst enemies. We communicate the importance of dental insurance to the point where our patients think, well, if I don't have insurance, I can't have any work done. Right. That's nothing further than the truth. And in fact, there are fewer individuals covered with dental insurance in the, in the United States now than there are uninsured. So by asking that question, when they call, if that person who is answering the telephone the first or second question is, do you have dental insurance? That is teaching a lesson to our patients. They would not have asked that question had it not been important. So should we position ourselves to ask that question? No, we need to position ourselves to be able to answer it appropriately. Um, but it should not be the first thing out of our mouth. And in fact, you should set that aside when a patient calls. You know, love to be able to address that. Happy to do that in just a minute, but before we do that, can I get to know you a little bit better because I want to understand what the situation is that you're experiencing and to see if it's a good fit for us. Would it be something we'll be able to address and would we be comfortable and you be comfortable? So could we could we learn a little bit about more about you before we diagnose your dental insurance needs? Yeah. That's now yeah, no, I want you to go into this too, because you and I are on the same page. Put it aside, like when somebody offers you the lousiest insurance right away, 90, you get to see this, 99% yeah. of all team members respond and they go, well, we don't participate. Right. What you're, what you're saying, Roy, is 
take it and just put it aside and say, look, I love that question that you want to know if we participate with MetLife, but can I know your, can you share with me your name first? Talk about that concept and how important it is to triaging a new patient appropriately in your practice. Sure. It's, it's all about relationships. You know, it's, we in dentistry um, sometimes get focused on things that aren't necessarily the most important. Patients don't care about much else. Number one, they want to under, understand that you have listened to them and you understand their needs and you're willing to address those needs. Sometimes patients call and ask, "Are you? do you take my insurance? And they have no idea of what other question to ask. Right. So um, to be able to always answer the question directly and correctly, but I would also introduce the patient to who you are as a practice and where you focus on that relationship with the, with the patient, uh, with the, the fact that you're going to provide the care that they need, not based on anything else other than the, that, um, that overall diagnosis and what needs to be done to be able to treat that condition. You don't diagnose their insurance plan. You diagnose their condition. When, when involved in that conversation, you always start the conversation with, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to be able to address that. Certainly, we're going to be able to do that for you. But, but first, can we get to know who you are? Uh, we want to make sure that we're the, the practice that you feel comfortable with and are uh, happy to be able to come in and receive the services. So can we start that conversation that way? Most patients are very receptive to that. And it does, it sets the stage. It sets the stage. It's not about the insurance benefits. It's about providing the adequate care for that individual as they present to the practice. Amen, brother. And I, I, I mean, I can do like 10 one hour shows on this and I've listened to you speak and I love this one. Um, one of the most important differentiations most people have to understand or everybody should understand in dentistry is do you accept it, my insurance and are you in my network? Those are not the same questions, right? Those Correct. are, can Correct. you just, can you add some, um, some context to that just because I love sure. the way you describe that. No, absolutely. Um, if you sign a PPO contract, you're in network, which means that you are part of that PPO network of doctors. Do you accept my insurance? If you accept assignment of benefits, then you do accept their insurance. So are you technically in network? No. Do you accept their benefits? Yes. And the way to describe that when a patient asks, I would say, I would do it this way. I would say, we see a number of patients with your plan and Mary on our team will do everything she possibly can to maximize every cent you have coming available for the treatment that you provide. But to be truthful with you and to be perfectly honest, our doctor has made a decision. The doctor has decided they will not be limited by the stipulations by that insurance plan. They, that plan has some limitations on what they will be able to reimburse and what you would receive appropriately in that plan. Our doctor is not comfortable modifying the treatment plan based on what the insurance plan is going to pay. The insurance plan can actually actually stipulate to us what can be paid. We're not going to do that. We want to be a relationship office where the relationship is between you and me without somebody else telling us how you are going to be in reimbursing the treatment you can receive. The doctor doesn't feel comfortable limiting the treatment that you perceive to what the insurance says you can have. And that's the reason why we've chosen not to be in network. We do accept assignment of benefits. The only amount that you'll need to pay us is the amount that the insurance does not cover. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Love it. And we're speaking to this. You're already starting to speak to this, but you and I talked about this before we went live. Even if you're not accepting insurance or participating, there are a lot of things that you've got to be good at this game, right? Like this is absolutely. Can you speak to somebody that's not participating right now? Because I want them to get. Yeah. I want them to understand uh, how important this is too. No, congratulations if you're not. As far as the practice goes, like I said, more individuals do not have insurance than do. Um, there are multiple ways that you can address that issue. There are participation plans that you can offer to your patients that may offer a slight discount. As you talked before, people want to know that they are getting some kind of benefit or offer, that there is some benefit for them coming to your practice. And I've seen a lot of people advertise no insurance, no problem. We have a plan that you can become a member of that will reduce your, um, your out-of-pocket expense. 
I would encourage you, if even if you are in network with some plans, you look at um, a way to promote your practice to those patients who are looking for a little bit of something. If they don't have insurance, they shouldn't think I can't have my dental work done. They should think, okay, this practice does take into consideration I don't have insurance and there are benefits to me as an uninsured so that they can uh, see the benefit of coming to that practice. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I could not uh, say more, I couldn't give you more support for that because we're seeing it everywhere and people are noticing how easy it is to implement those things. And Roy, can I, can I give you like some of my toughest questions? Like here's- Please do. So we're talking about people that might be not on insurance, but I also get these too. I get some young dentists in Texas and they'll go, look, Kirk, easy to say, but I have 5,000 patients and I'm 100% PPO. Like I don't write a letter and get off of these things because that's financial disaster. Where yes. do I start? Like, give me an idea of what the treatment plan looks like ahead. If I'm completely 100% PPO and I'm, I want to, I want to start moving. Like, we're not talking about going cold turkey. We're talking about taking yes. small steps to reduce the influence over time. What would you say to those guys? I'd, I would be, I would base my decision on your practice overhead and the amount. Uh, the reduction that you're having to take when you do those plans. Okay. If your overhead is, like I said, 60, 70%, and you're having to write off 40%, you're actually losing money to see those patients. You're actually out of pocket is more than what you're actually receiving when that patient comes in. Right. So in order to calculate that, I see a number of offices who actually only post the, the fee schedule. That is very, very dangerous. Right. If you only post your fee schedule on the claim because you don't want to take those write-offs prior to, you don't know what write-off you're taking. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you always to use your full fee on that insurance claim form. Then do an assessment. Run a report that establishes the amount of write-off, the amount that your regular fee is, and how much you had to write off for that plan to find out what the actual write-off is. Look at your office overhead to find out how appropriate it would be for you to continue to see those patients. If you're writing off more than your uh, the, the amount that your overhead allows you as far as profitability, if you're writing all that off, there's no reason to be in that plan. Those patients are actually losing money when you see them. And as difficult as it is to lose patients, those patients, you're losing money by seeing them. So you need to, you need to look long and hard at those and, um, Establish a protocol. And when you decide not to be in a particular plan, there are ways to be able to share that with your patients in a way that will reduce the amount of impact that you'll feel as a result of that decision to come out of network. Will you keep all your patients? No. Will you lose a number of them? Yes. But there again, by being out of network, the few that you lose if you're now out of network and you're able to charge your full fee, it will greatly make up for the ones that you lose in the process. It's all a matter of numbers. So use your full fee because number one, the you'll be able to calculate the write-off. Number two, you'll be able, the insurance companies use the submitted fees to establish their fee schedules. So if you're reducing your fee to what they're going to pay, when they look at that, they're, they're looking, well, a number of our dentists, are, we're paying 100% on. So yeah. maybe we need to reduce our fees because we're paying way more than we need to. We shouldn't be paying 100% anyway. So that, that falsifies really what your usual and customary fee is in your practice. And thirdly, if patient has multiple plans, if you do that write-off, you can actually end up with what looks like negative balances. And I see a lot of practices when I do audits that have huge numbers of negative, um, negative patient balances. And it's not because they actually are negative balances. It's because they did the, the write-offs incorrectly. So do not do any write-offs when you're paid until all the individual payers on that service have paid. Then you look at the amount that um, you received as opposed to your full fee and determine the write-off at that time. Mm -hmm. We're getting a ton of feedback and questions. So Lori Owens asked this question, Roy, yes. um, would you advise to code each write-off per PPO company, i.e. Delta, MetLife, et cetera, so you can see what write-off, uh, so, so you can see what you write off for each company? Would you? Yeah, 
I, I would go further than that. I would I would organize according to plan because there are companies that have different plans with different write offs. So all deltas are not are not equal. There may be a plan where the fee schedule may vary actually with under the the delta umbrella. So there again, junk in, junk out your software. You need to leverage the um, information that you're able to get from that. And I would enter every plan separately so that if you have three MetLife, you've got three different MetLife plans. So you can calculate your write-offs individually for those. There may be a MetLife plan that pays very well and another one that doesn't pay very well. So even under the large umbrella of the larger companies, the plans can vary. So I would I would track that by plan. Do not do um, any write-offs, as I said, until everybody's paid and in, based on um, the fee schedules. If a patient has multiple insurances, they get benefit of the least fee schedule. Mm -hmm. So if you've got three, the maximum amount you can charge or the patient is responsible for is the least. So in an example, if say your crown fee is $1,000, you're just throwing that fee out there because it's simple to calculate. So patient has two insurances. Primary insurance allows 700. Secondary insurance allows 800. Maximum patient out of pocket would be the 700 to pay for the crown. Mm -hmm. However, if both pay and you get $900, even though it's over the fee schedule established by plan number one, you actually keep the $900 and write off the 100 from your 1,000 down to 900. Wow. So okay. We, we see a lot of people who will write off the 300 and all of a sudden they get the $900 payment total and seven, eight, nine, that's $200. They think is a negative balance. It's not mm -hmm. the fee schedule establishes the, the maximum out of pocket that the patient is responsible for. But if you receive more than that into your practice, you keep that amount up to your full fee. Now, if they pay more than your full fee, unless it is a supplemental plan, You'll need to contact the secondary payer, and I would give them both of the EOBs and ask them what they want to do with the money. Most of the times, they don't even respond. You know, that being the case, just document your attempts to be able to return the overpayment, but otherwise, do not return the money. Ask them what to do with the money because otherwise, it can be an accounting nightmare. Yeah, as you can see, this guy is a genius. Now, you mentioned reimbursement. Um, I get this question all the time. There are some, well, number one, when I ask young dentists, I'm like, show me your contract. They can't find the contract that they sign. I'm like, you signed yeah. it. They're like, where? So you got to keep your contracts. Now, are these contracts negotiable? Because I've heard that some are and some aren't. So if I'm participating, Roy, give us some insight and because it used to be easier than it is now. Can't Are the big ones you can't negotiate? Like, give us some perspective. Yeah. As far as the deltas, I, I don't know of a delta that would negotiate. Several other companies will negotiate. If it's a new company in a particular area or as a new dentist, I would encourage you to never accept that fee schedule the first time it's offered to you. I always respond, um, you know, I appreciate your being able to provide this fee schedule. However, it was less than I'm willing to accept at this time. Would there be any uh, potential negotiation of those fees? So if it's a new company in uh, an area and they're trying to establish a network, they'll be more open to negotiation. Or if the doctor is in the middle of nowhere and there may be a company who has um, uh, bought a plan that um, they're trying to put together a network, the more leverage the doctor has, the greater the chance of negotiating that fee. If you don't ask for it, you'll never get it. It's kind of like trading cars. Never start, start with a base. That's always an offer for them. You're always offer back on the other side. Never accept what they offer first. Always, always counter. And you'd be surprised. And even dentists who have uh, been in network for a while, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and, and have that conversation maybe every year, every two years about the, the fees and also be cognizant of the, the sweet spot in your practice. Most practices, 95% um, of the codes that they submit are 90 in number. So there are 90 codes that all of them use uh, most frequently. Negotiate on the 90 you use. The other ones you don't need to care about because you don't do those services or seldom submit those. So focus on your negotiation on those fees that are most commonly provided, whether that be crowns or simple restorative or your preventive services. 
And also be aware that there are conditions that will increase the frequency of reimbursement. For example, um, a lot of plans with ladies who are pregnant, they will increase the frequency of their reimbursement for their preventive services. So be aware that there are even variations within plans depending on the patient's condition. Yeah. Now, um, I love this. And uh, one of the micro trends we're seeing, can you speak to this too, is I have some fee-for-service dentists in the Buckhead, Atlanta area, and there's a plan in which people are coming around knocking on these dentist doors saying, I'm going to give you 100% of your fee. And they're like, oh, you could never pay my fee. And they're throwing the fee at them. And this company's going, yeah, we'll pay it. Now, is there a buyer beware when it comes to that? Because they're throwing big fees at this company and this company's saying, absolutely. Yeah, you have to be careful about that. If it sounds too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. So that might be a bait and switch. It might be something that they're trying to encourage the network to um, to build the, net, the network. And more than likely, there's a clause in that contract that says it can be changed unilaterally with 30 days notice. So you can be in uh, for a short amount of time and the next thing you know, the terms of that contract has changed. They can do that by sending you a letter. I know most practices haven't read the contact contract to begin with, but there is a clause in the contract that allows the insurance carrier to change that um, the terms of that contract unilaterally by just n- letting you know. So those letters that come from the insurance company that nobody reads, you open it and it's all this this crazy uh, legalese. In the middle of that, it may disclose that the terms of the contract has changed. The fee schedule is changing. And if you throw that in the trash can, you don't know. So always from an insurance company, make sure that you open it and you make yourself aware of what is in that that letter because they may have changed the terms of that contract, notifying you by letter and you didn't read it. And all of a sudden, something significant changes in reimbursement and you're going, wow, how did this happen? Yeah. That's how it happened. But wait a minute, I signed a contract and now I've got 300 patients from this plan and now you're going to change. Re- you can't do that. But they, uh, yeah, they can. can. Oh, yeah, they can. You, the contract you've signed with them to participate allows them to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Doc- absolutely. Doctors need to be aware when they sign those contracts that there are some quote unquote handcuffs that are attached to that contract that they need to be aware of. Yeah. And Darla Rich just wrote uh, on the comment feed, we also encourage employers to negotiate with insurance companies for better benefit allowances for their employees. Do you have anything to say about that? Well, absolutely. Um, one One of the strongest weapons in your arsenal are your patients. If you have a plan that is particularly hard to deal with, I would have a discussion with that patient and explain to them their reimbursement is being limited by this plan that they need to have a discussion with the HR department that they're dissatisfied with the plan. The the individual who makes the the decision about the plan can, if it is a, a, they, when they buy the insurance for their employees, they expect a certain level of service and reimbursement. And if it's not meeting that level, when it comes time to re-up that contract with that plan, they'll look for something that's more beneficial to their patients. So send the patients to the the employer and and tell them, you know, this is not a great plan. It's limited. It will not pay for this, this, and this. We're dissatisfied. Could you, as an employer, look for a plan that covers more of what we need? And that will um, help to... Uh, direct that employer to a plan that is more beneficial for the patient and for the uh, practice. Yeah, this is awesome. And then, um, you know, any other tricks or tips to maximize reimbursement that you might add um, Um, that we should consider? Yeah, you need to be aware of what are, I call magic words, when you're submitting the claim to the carrier. There are some, some of the, well, Many of the people who are listening to this podcast may have noticed when they call for um, service on a particular claim you've sent for a patient, the person who is speaking on the other end does not necessarily speak English very well anymore. Um, The reason for that is it's being farmed um, to um, India or wherever it might be, and they know nothing about dentistry. They know nothing about um, what we do, but they are armed with a list of what they need to see in a narrative to justify the reimbursement for a particular service. And if they don't see that word, they're going to deny it based on 
it not being supported by the documentation. One of those, for example, core buildups, um, it, it's becoming more and more difficult to get core buildups reimbursed. The magic word to justify the need for a core buildup is retention. Wow, that, that's good. That, that meaning that without the core buildup, the tooth would not be able to retain the crown. That would be justification for the core buildup rather than um, the uh, 2949, which is uh, a code that describes a restoration you may place to make the um, make the prep pretty or ideal rather than it being necessary to retain the crown. So retention is the magic word there. Um, another example is for uh, elevating a, an extraction from a simple extraction to a surgical extraction. One of two things has to happen. The tooth had to be sectioned or the bone removed to be able to get the tooth out. Those are the two magic words. If one or both of those are in the narrative that establishes that the doctor had to section the tooth or to remove bone to get the tooth out, that will justify the reimbursement. So you, you need to be aware that there are certain trigger words, like I say, magic words that need to be in that claim for it to be justified and reimbursed. Um, you need to, um, be aware of that when you're submitting the claim to make sure that the doctor makes notation in the clinical record, as well as being able to transfer that to the claim so that the documentation is consistent. That is amazing. Now, if you practice for three decades, you know how important the words Roy just shared are? Like, you've got to stay educated because this, this is a game that's never going to change. The rules and all of these well, things. The game's always changing. It's, wow. it's getting well, harder to sorry. play. It's never, <laughs> it's never going to stay the same. That's what I meant to say. Thank you so much. Um, also, too, Roy, I want you to talk about this because there are there's a lot of talk when people are scared and nervous. You've got to really do this the right way because the word audit scares everybody. Can you just speak to it? Because I hear it all the time. Auditing is it is terrible. You never want to have one. What are some simple right. things a dentist watching this can do to to reduce the opportunity for that to happen? Um, insurance companies, the only thing they share among one another are their submission statistics. So everybody who submits claims to insurance companies are automatically profiled. They keep track of the frequencies that are associated with um, particular services that we provide. And if you start to move one or two or three standard deviations from what's considered the average, that would tend to trigger an audit. It doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong, but it does mean that your documentation needs to very, very dramatically support the treatment that you provided. For example, um, general practice, as far as extractions go, the frequency of regular extractions as opposed to surgical extractions are in the neighborhood of 35 to 45. So 35, 45 would be surgical as opposed to uh, simple extractions. If that doctor's frequency starts to move to 50 to 60 to 70 percent of your extractions are surgical as opposed to uh, simple, that is going to move you out on that bell curve to one or two standard deviations from what's normal um, and could trigger an audit. And audits are, are different in that most do a very small sample when they audit but they use the findings, a percentage to extrapolate um, and to expand that to a larger period of time and the request for reimbursements are even greater. Um, example I can share with you, there was a doctor who submitted a PA to support the need for a crown. The consultant, when reviewing that claim at the insurance um, company, the PA that was submitted to support the need for that crown was not a good one. It was not diagnostic. So that that person who reviewed it thought, if they think this is diagnostic, I wonder if we do an audit of this practice, what we're going to find. They did. They did an audit. They pulled 15 charts. They looked at the radiographs that were um, taken and billed for in that practice, and 17% of them were non-diagnostic. They um, were clinically unacceptable. So they used that 17% number. They multiplied that by the entire um, global reimbursement for all the radiographs taken in that practice for six years. And this doctor was asked to return $72,000 based on the fact that the percentage of non-diagnostic x-rays that were billed for. So ultimately that's 
audits, like I said, can be on a small scale, but they can use the numbers that they find to extrapolate to a larger pool. And the numbers that they're asking for are becoming staggering. It's crazy. That is so crazy. Now, yeah. I there's so many rabbit holes that I want to go down when we talk, but this is this is just a great start, Roy. I'm going to have you back consistently and just uncover a lot of these topics. But I'm going to say this to you guys as viewers. This is why this guy is such a gem and such a great influencer in dentistry because you can't sit there and get negative or get frustrated because that's never going to go away. If you're looking for help, Roy, I know people are watching this and they're going to want more of what you can do. Now, you do sure. you actually do consultations where you'll, will you go to people's offices? Like, how does that work? Give us a little bit. Yeah, okay. um, I, I can do on site, or if you're electronic, I can do it off site. What? Um, services I offer as far as um, being able to analyze your documentation and make recommendations for improvement, can look at your submission um, frequencies and to give you an idea if there's some areas of concern. Not that you're doing anything wrong, but might be that there's a risk because your frequencies are off what's considered normal can do that. Also can analyze the submissions to see if there are some things that you're leaving on the table, not getting paid for that you could submit, be paid for uh, to maximize your legitimate reimbursement. I'm kind of a, a documentation billing coding nerd. It, it's kind of, you know, it takes a special sick kind of individuals to enjoy that, but that's, that's, you know, that gets my juices going. I love to be able to help offices maximize their legitimate benefit and reduce the risks. Right, you're the best. And for those of you that are listening to on iTunes, you might not have the benefit of seeing this interview. Uh, but uh, Roy, can you tell us your website if somebody's listening? How do they sure. find you? It's just RoyShelburne.com, R O Y S H E L B U R N E.com. It'll have um, information about um, me and about where I'm going to be as far as speaking goes and how to contact me and love to have a conversation. Um, love to be able to share my story, not because I'm proud of it, but because I, I am passionate about making sure that my colleagues um, do not suffer the same consequences I did. Buddy, you are such a great help. And uh, I, again, I can't highly encourage you guys enough. If you haven't had, if you're looking for a great speaker for your study club, this is your guy. So Roy, thank you so much great. for being on. Continue to add great questions to the feed. And Roy, you'll see he'll get back to you and answer. We just got another one here. So it's good stuff. This is always a hot topic. You yeah. know this, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, happy to help. Thanks so much for having me, Kirk. It's always okay. a great experience. Thank you. Oh, it's our pleasure. And thank you. So stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for watching today. We are so grateful that you're watching. If you enjoyed today, which I know you did, just do us a favor, hit the share button, share this with your friends uh, and help us protect this great profession that we call dentistry. And so until we see you next time, keep watching the best practice show. You guys have a great rest of your day.